Okay, look, I'm not about to give you a rundown of Spider-Man. It's Spider-Man. Everyone knows Spider-Man. He's just that ubiquitous. We all know the story. Peter Parker, bitten by a radioactive spider, did nothing to stop a robbery, said robber murders his Uncle Ben and instilled a drive in Peter to always do the right thing no matter the cost. What makes Spider-Man so great is how infinitely relatable he is in spite of his superpowers. He has money problems. He has to worry about making rent despite just saving the city from Doc Ock. He has a social life to juggle on top of his hero duties. We can all see a little bit of our own lives in the struggles Peter faces. Maybe not when he's under the mask, but definitely in his life overall. Spider-Man is essentially synonymous with Marvel. He's a generational touchstone no matter how old you are. Some may remember the 60s cartoon or the 70s Nicholas Hammond TV show. Some might have come up on Spider-Man and his amazing friends in the 1980s. I myself grew up with the 1990s animated series and the Sam Raimi movie trilogy in my formative years. Some might have only even just gotten familiar with him through the recent MCU and Sony animated movies and video games. We all have a Spider-Man gateway, and I wouldn't be surprised if for some people in the 90s and 2000s, it was Capcom's Marvel Fighters. With a character as big as Spider-Man, there was no way he was ever going to miss out on this series, and sure enough, Spider-Man got into the first Capcom fighter to expand beyond the X-Men, Marvel superheroes. Spider-Man's visual design in the series is interesting is he's the character that stayed the most consistent visually, even in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. His design in the Versus games seems very specifically styled after artist Mark Bagley's take on the character. Bagley, who was lead artist on Amazing Spider-Man when Marvel superheroes would have been in development, is probably the artist that leaned hardest into depicting Spidey with a more pronounced arachnidesque anatomy. All you have to do is take one look at a Bagley-drawn Spidey and yep, you can definitely see that proportionate strength of a spider. Bagley's style is very much a refinement of the style presented by artist Eric Larson, who himself refined the style established by Todd McFarlane. Of particular note is Spidey's idol pose. It's not only unique, but by far one of, if not the most memorable idol stances in the series. It's a little weird looking out of context, yet it manages to be so Spidey at the same time. His voice actor in every pre-Marvel vs. Capcom 3 entry is Patrick Chilvers. He doesn't seem to have done much acting work past the 2000s, though. I'm not quite sure what else to say about a character as universal as Spider-Man, so let's just head into the analysis. Spider-Man's first appearance in a Capcom fighter was in 1995's Marvel Super Heroes. He's interesting in that he seems to be the Marvel equivalent to a Shoto. He has a projectile, an uppercut anti-air, and a horizontally traveling kick attack. He's traditionally a pretty easy to pick up and play character, and that was probably by design. According to former Capcom staff member Katsuya Akitomo, he presented the Marvel Super Heroes development team with a translated copy of Amazing Spider-Man issue 350. This issue saw Spidey go up against Doctor Doom, and aside from that issue inspiring the vast majority of Doom's moveset in the series, he also showed it to the devs to make them fans of Spidey, and his never say die attitude even in the face of overwhelming odds. Honestly, I'd say it paid off. He's a flashy, incredibly fun character to use, and everything from his animations to his moveset to his theme are dripping with personality. Spidey's also the first and one of only a handful of characters in the series to utilize comic book word bubbles when taunting or attacking. Do your job. Come on. Hey. The others being Norimaro, Venom, Villain, Deadpool, This is my taunt. <laughs> Get it? And to an extent, Phoenix Wright. I got it. I've got all I need. He has the ability to wall jump by jumping onto the side of the screen and then pressing the opposite horizontal direction. His first special move is Web Ball. This is a projectile that ensnares the opponent in webs if they don't block, rendering them immobile. This can be done in the air as well. Web ball. Dragon Punch and Punch is Spider Sting, his anti-air. If you press punch again at the maximum height of his initial uppercut, he'll smack them back down to the ground as well. Spider sting. Spider sting. Next is web swing, done with a quarter circle back and kick. 
This one can be done in the air as well. The heavier the kick strength, the farther he travels, but the move also has more startup the stronger the version. Web swing. Web throw is done with a half circle back and punch. Spidey shoots out a web and if it connects, he spins the ensnared opponent around before throwing them in the opposite direction. The punch button pressed determines the angle of the web. Light punch is forward, medium is at a 45 degree angle, and heavy is straight up. Spidey's lone hyper combo in this game is also his most iconic. Maximum Spider, done with a quarter circle forward and two punches. Maximum spider. <laughs> Spidey leaps into the wall closest to him and then performs a dive and kick at the opponent. If it connects, he leaps across the edges of the screen, striking your opponent as he passes them. For as cool as this attack looks, the initial hit has some notoriously awful tracking in most of the series. This move, as well as the Capcom version of Spider-Man himself, actually makes an appearance in the Spider-Verse comic event. With the world the Marvel vs. games take place in being designated Earth-30847. He, uh, unfortunately didn't make it out unscathed, but it's comic books, he probably got better off screen. Still need that the series is canonically part of the Marvel multiverse though. Spider-Man gets a unique buff from the Power Gem. When he attacks, a clone appears opposite his opponent and attacks at the same time he does. This doubles the hits of any combo he does and increases his damage output temporarily. Spider-Man's stage in this game is on what appears to be a scaffolding lift ascending the side of a building across from the Daily Bugle, as you can see it in the window reflections behind the player characters. The start of the stage takes place at what looks like sunset, as there's an orange hue applied to the reflected buildings in the background. As the lift ascends, the sky gets darker as night falls, and you begin to see behind some of the windows of the building. Some people are cheering the fighters on, some are on the phone watching the fight, and there's this unfortunate guy who probably needs to put on a new pot of coffee. The lift ascends even higher, and you once again see the city reflected though this time you're high enough up that you can see straight down into Lower Manhattan. A neat little environmental detail is the Twin Towers. Because you can see their reflection in the windows, we can infer that we're on the southern side of this large building, as that's the only side that would have their reflection. Furthermore, the reflection is properly located on the far left side of the screen. The World Trade Center was by the southwestern tip of Manhattan so this is an accurate representation of how they would have been reflected off of a midtown Manhattan skyscraper. Speaking of skyscrapers, you can also see the Empire State Building a little lower in the reflection. This means that wherever this building is, it's likely north of 34th Street, as the Empire State Building is on 34th and 5th Avenue. If I had to guess, this stage is probably somewhere between 42nd and 57th Street, as there's no shortage of skyscrapers there. A helicopter starts recording the fight at the top of the building as well. Granted, Marvel superheroes fights tend to occur quick enough that you'll likely never see this stage cycle play out fully, but it's still a neat detail. Spidey's theme in this game is an upbeat number with some really prominent percussion. He, along with Captain America, are the only two characters in the entire Versus series to retain arrangements of their debut theme in each of their subsequent appearances. Though in the case of Marvel Infinite, they are used for the game's credits theme instead of their character theme. Here are Spidey's two colors. And here's his ending.
Spidey doesn't change too dramatically in Marvel Superheroes vs. Street Fighter, but there are additions. First though, I'd like to talk about his theme. It's a remix of his Marvel Superheroes theme, and it's not only in my opinion his best theme, but one of my favorite themes in the entire series, and a great example of how the composers of this series perfectly encapsulated these characters in their themes. First off, there's a dramatic opening that no other version of the theme has before that familiar main melody kicks in. Moreover, there's a tinge of melancholy that you don't really hear in any other rendition of the song. One of the thematic cornerstones of Spider-Man as a character is doing the right thing even at the risk of massive self-sacrifice. This is something that gets reinforced in Peter's life on a fairly regular basis, and I think contrasted against the similar sounding but slightly more upbeat theme from the previous game, it really highlights the duality of Spider-Man's life. If his Marvel superheroes theme is evocative of the thrill of great power, then the Marvel vs. Street Fighter theme represents the burden of great responsibility. I think the series, at least all of the entries pre-Infinite, do a great job at encapsulating what the Marvel characters are about through their themes, and this is perhaps the most triumphant example of it, at least in my opinion. Am I overthinking what's more than likely just meant to be a more dramatic arrangement of his first theme? Probably. But if a song is inciting those kinds of thoughts in the first place, I'd say it's doing its job. Onto his moveset, Wall Jump gets a slight buff in that it now allows him to cling to the wall for an extended period of time. He'll still jump off after some time, but he can definitely linger for a while now. Web Throw can also have its animation extended by twirling the control stick or d-pad around and mashing the buttons during the animation. This doesn't seem to affect damage too much though. Also, minor annotation to a previous video here, but someone pointed out that I neglected to mention that you can do the same for Venom's web throw in Marvel 1 as well. Most notably, our webhead gets a new hyper combo in this game, Crawler Assault. This is a grounded hyper combo that sees Spidey pummel the stuffing out of his opponent before ending things with a powerful kick. Spidey's assist in this game is Web Swing. Before moving on to Marvel 1 though, let's talk about Armored Spider-Man. I've talked about this in the previous cut content videos, but Armored Spider-Man wasn't initially planned for this game. One of the staff members wanted to add Spider-Man with the symbiote suit but the proposal was turned down because the time and money needed to animate that would have gone beyond the scope of the game's development. They instead went with Armored Spider-Man since giving him special properties and changing his color palette was a lot more feasible. Armored Spider-Man plays exactly like Spidey with two minor distinctions. He has a very slightly lower regular jump, and he gets one hit of super armor, similar to Hulk in this game. Other than that, he's pretty much exactly the same. Here are Spider-Man's colors in the arcade version. And here are his additional colors added in the PS1 and Sega Saturn ports. Here are Armored Spider-Man's basic colors. And here are the two additional colors in the console ports. And here's Spider-Man's ending.
Additionally, I want to talk about a special Spider-Man themed easter egg. If you play on this specific stage and Spider-Man isn't present on either player's team, Peter will be in the background snapping photos. If you get too close to him, his spider sense goes off and he hunches over as if he's about to jump into the fray and throw hands himself. However, if Spider-Man is present on either team, Peter is instead replaced with an angry J. Jonah Jameson being restrained by Robbie Robertson. What do you think he's more mad about? Peter being nowhere to be found or Spider-Man being there? My bet's on the latter. Aunt May is also present in the background seating regardless of which easter egg is triggered. There's a redhead who seems to have broken one of her heels with her back turned to the action. I've always assumed this was maybe Mary Jane, but I'm not quite confident about that. Could just be a random person. Our heroic web-slinger predictably made the roster for Marvel vs. Capcom 1, and like the previous game, doesn't see too many dramatic changes, but does get a few neat things. For one, he gets an air dash, done by double tapping or pressing all three punch buttons in the air. He can act out of this surprisingly fast, so it's a good way to apply some surprise pressure. Ha! Ha! Web swing! He also gets another new hyper combo, ultimate web throw, done with a quarter circle back motion and two punches. <laughs> the startup is huge, so this works best as a way to punish someone. One thing he loses, and this remains true for the rest of the series, is his wall cling. For whatever reason, it reverts back to its Marvel superheroes incarnation, where he immediately wall jumps instead of optionally sticking to the wall. I'm not sure if this was removed for balancing reasons, or if him having it in the first place was an unintentional bug, but it seems weird that it was removed for good after, especially considering Strider got a wall cling in the very same game. The Marvel 1 arrangement of his theme is perhaps the most unique of them all. The intro starts out in line with the previous themes, but quickly segs into a jazzier rendition of the main melody we're used to. I actually kinda like this version and have only grown fonder of it over time. I still like most of his other themes more, but this one's okay. The Daily Bugle shows up again as a stage here, with the stage itself taking place on both the roof of the bugle and an adjacent building, both of whom are connected together by some webbing. This appears to be a separate building from the one seen in Marvel Superheroes, so they either moved or this is some kind of satellite office. There's a billboard on the right of the screen that says Gold Street. There's two Gold Streets I'm aware of in New York City. One is in Brooklyn near the Manhattan Bridge, and the other is just across the East River in the Financial District. Given the proximity of the next background element I'm about to discuss though, I imagine it's probably the name of the storefront and not the location, as it wouldn't make geographical sense otherwise. If you super jump and look to the right, you'll see a building with the Fantastic Four logo adorning the top. This is the Baxter Building, also known as the home of the Fantastic Four. It's pretty interesting to see this here, as Capcom more than likely weren't able to actually use characters from the IP in the series between Marvel Super Heroes and Marvel 2, due to Acclaim having exclusive video game rights to the characters, similarly to Iron Man. However, sticking their insignia in somewhere was probably still okay legally, and the fact that it's kind of tucked away somewhere you'd have to go out of your way to see, makes me feel like it might have been a cheeky little act of defiance on Capcom's part. An act probably cleared with Marvel legally admittedly, but cheeky all the same. That said, the Baxter building is typically located in Midtown, on 42nd and Madison, which is quite far from the Gold Street found in Lower Manhattan. Here are Spider-Man's colors in the arcade version. And here are his bonus colors in the PS1 port. And here's his ending.
I know you're probably getting tired of me saying this, but Spidey doesn't really change at all in Marvel 2. And for better or worse, he's pretty much the same as Marvel 1. His first assist is Web Ball. Web Ball. His second assist is Web Swing. Web Swing. Hey. His third assist is Spider Sting. Spider Sting. Hey. And here are all of his colors. Before we move to Marvel 3, let's talk comics. Spider-Man, being the enduring character he is, has a lot of reading material, and a lot of it is pretty great. And some aren't so great. I actually had a tough time deciding on the recommendation for this, because there's so many good Spidey stories and arcs. There's Chip Zdarsky's fantastic spectacular Spider-Man run from a few years back. There is great one-off stories like The Kid Who Collects Spider-Man, or one of my personal favorite comic stories of all time, Spider-Man Blue. There's dramatic stories like The Death of Gene DeWolf, The Night When Stacy Died, or The Phenomenal Craven's Last Hunt. There's even great long-form runs by specific creative teams. Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley have an outstanding 111-issue run on Ultimate Spider-Man. I'm a huge fan of Roger Stern's run from the 1980s, and some of the most interesting, cerebral stories in Spidey's history come from J.M. DeMatteis' writing, including the aforementioned Craven's Last Hunt. John Michael Straczynski's Amazing Spider-Man run is another favorite of mine, for paving the way for some of the weirder parts of the Spider-Man corner of the Marvel Universe, which Dan Slott would eventually piggyback off of for his later Spider-Verse stories. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that every one of those runs, from its antagonist to its leverage of Spider-Man's supporting cast, arguably the best in the entire medium, can all be traced back to one stellar, ultimately enduring run. This video's comic book recommendation is the original run of Amazing Spider-Man by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. While some of the terminology, slang, and struggles in this era may be a little dated, it cannot be underlined enough just how far ahead of its time this comic book run is, both in terms of portraying a down-to-earth relatable superhero that just so happened to be a teenager, and for its incredible world building, establishing from the jump that Spidey exists alongside other superheroes, and establishing what might be the most recognizable rogues gallery in the medium, with only really Batman having the other fair stake to that claim. So much of who Peter is and what he and his world ultimately becomes is established in this run. In the character work Lee and Ditko provide for Peter, his supporting cast, and even his villains is second to none, especially considering the era. Of particular note is If This Be My Destiny, one of the first big storylines to really put Spidey through the ringer, and culminates in one of the best Spider-Man moments of all time, where Spidey, motivated by his love for and duty to protect his loved ones, manages to lift himself up from a large chunk of machinery that had him pinned down. I could go on and on, but I really do believe this is one of the most special comic book runs ever written, and if you haven't read it or are even tired of Cape Comics at the moment, I still think it's worth a read if you haven't already read it. Spidey returns in Marvel 3, and while his moveset is largely the same, some things were readjusted. His voice actor here is Josh Keaton, who perhaps is best known for playing the web slinger in the fantastic, taken from us way too soon, spectacular Spider-Man cartoon. Of all the voice actors Spider-Man's had in his several decades of cartoons and video games, the first two that come to mind when I think of the character are him and Christopher Daniel Barnes. Web Ball is largely the same. Web Ball! As is Spider Sting, though the follow-up attack is now officially named Spider Bite, and you have to press Heavy Punch specifically to initiate it after any version of Spider Sting, regardless of strength. Spider Sting! Spider Sting! Web Swing is now a reverse Dragon Punch motion instead of a quarter circle back. Not entirely sure why, considering it doesn't overlap with any other inputs, but sure. Air combo. Cool. 
Web throw is still done with a half circle back, though he can no longer extend the animation by mashing. See you later. Yes. Web throw. See you later. He does get one new thing though, web glide. This lets Spidey zip across the screen in multiple directions and can even be done in the air. Spidey can cancel normals and even specials into this, so not only is this good for general mobility, but it allows him to make himself safe in certain situations. Maximum Spider is still here, where it has a cool new cinematic animation where each hit accumulates some webbing. Dude! Get ready! Maximum Spider! With dedicated kick buttons being removed, Crawler Assault is now done with a Dragon Punch motion and two attacks. Dude! Crawler Assault! Having fun yet? Ultimate Web Throw has undergone the biggest change, however. The web now only ensnares airborne opponents, making it strictly an anti air super. Unlike previous games, though, Spidey can actually get follow ups off of this thanks to Web Glide, so while it requires some setup, it has far more utility now. Ultimate gotcha. Go! Spidey's assists are largely the same as they were in Marvel 2. There's Web Ball, Crossover Web, ball. I'm out of here. Web Swing, Crossover Web Swing. Swing. I'm out of here. Crossover Web Swing. Swing. I'm out of here. And Spider Sting. Crossover Spider assist. Sting. I'm out of here. Crossover Spider assist. Sting. I'm out of here. Spidey's theme in this game is the final arrangement of his classic theme that we'd hear, at least in the capacity of a combat theme, and it's a pretty great rendition of the song. There's a bit of a celebratory tone to this arrangement, which I think fits. This was the triumphant return of Marvel vs. Capcom after 11 years after all. The instrumentation is also pretty well done. I'm a big fan of the use of guitar. Spidey was revealed alongside Wesker at the 2010 Tokyo Game Show, and seeing his reveal trailer and hearing this remix is a pretty memorable moment for me, since it's very distinctly the moment that made me realize, holy shit, we're getting a new Marvel vs. Capcom game. Like, for real. Because Spidey's costume is largely one big texture layered over a character model, thanks to the simplicity of his costume design, Capcom was afforded a bit more flexibility for alternate colors here. So in the tradition of Spider-Man games both in the past and future, Spidey gets full-on alternate suits here. His first one is his Future Foundation suit from Jonathan Hickman's Future Foundation in Fantastic Four run, which saw Spidey joining the team for a bit. His second alternate color is based off of the stealth suit from Dan Slott's Big Time story arc. This suit has two modes, one with reddish-orange lighting and a more recognizable neon green coloring. The latter was actually used as one of Spidey's alts in the vanilla release of Marvel 3. His next alternate costume is the symbiote suit. Next up is the Iron Spider armor, which was given to Peter by Iron Man in the lead up to Civil War in the comics. Peter eventually ditches the suit when he switches allegiances and realizes that Tony was using the suit to spy on him. The Spider Armor Mark II is next up. This one is a successor to the original Spider Armor and first appeared in issue 656 of The Amazing Spider-Man. His final alternate costume is the fan favorite Scarlet Spider suit, made famous by Ben Riley, Peter's clone. We'll, uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Here's all of his interactions with the rest of the cast. It's time for a butt whooping, Supreme. You are but a minor annoyance to the Sorcerer Supreme. Ready? Fight! So now you're what? Sorcerer kind of okay ish? So, any relation to JJ? Go for broke! Fight! You know, you sort of look like the guy who ruined my marriage. This one references the infamous One More Day story that saw Peter willingly give up his marriage with Mary Jane in order to save a dying Aunt May. 
controversial doesn't even begin to explain this particular story. Though, Spidey shouldn't actually be able to remember the events of that story. Weird. If it's souls you're looking for, there's a guy named J. Jonah I'd like you to meet. I know a lot. Live and let die. Fight! Player one wins. Vengeance has been... <coughs> How do you do that? You got a black belt and stupid if you think you're gonna beat me. Spiders. I hate spiders. Live and let die. Fight! Ends. I must admit, beating the living snot out of you was a great honor. Kiss your mother with that face? Jeez. Hey there, Slick. We meet again. It's do or die. Fight! Gonna be hard to copy that butt kicking. Ain't you just the cutest widow thing? Whoa! You're a real hero? For real? It's do or die! Fight! Sorry, little guy. Beating you up's like stepping on a kitten. The Pet Avengers are an alternate universe team made up of pets of Marvel characters assembled by Lockjaw of the Inhumans, who gain telepathy after somehow getting the Mind Stone. Slimeball senses tingling. Learn your place. Live and let die. Fight! You've got great power, Albert, but you're not very responsible with it. This is, of course, referring to Felicia Hardy, the black cat. Spidey is also the only character in the series to have a special win quote for mirror matches in multiple games in the series, and they always make reference to clones. This is shouting out another infamous Spidey storyline, the Clone Saga. While the Clone Saga isn't necessarily bad, it was dragged on way longer than it was supposed to and became pretty convoluted, thanks to running through multiple Spider-Man books at the time making it pretty hard to follow. And here's Spidey's ending. The Daily Bugle once again appears as the main backdrop for a stage, taking place on a scaffolding adjacent to the building near what seems to be a parade celebrating the Marvel and Capcom characters. Given the Daily Bugle backdrop, the rising scaffolding, and the helicopter that shows up, it's possible that this stage might be an intentional shoutout to Spider-Man's original Marvel superhero stage, which played out almost the exact same way. On the ground, you can see parade floats of Spider-Man and Servot in the background. Spidey actually makes reference to this parade float in one of his win quotes, being kind of weirded out by it. You can see posters and building awnings for the Daily Bugle. The font for the Daily Bugle has often changed over time, but the one presented here is a pastiche of the New York City Daily News logo font. There's two photographers taking pictures in the background of the stage. Funnily enough, if you do an air combo while they're in the background, they'll jump pretty high up in order to snap a picture. They jump high enough that prior to Spider-Man being officially revealed for the game, some people thought one of these photographers might be Peter making a Marvel vs. Street Fire style cameo again. As the scaffolding starts to rise, they'll hop over the fence to get back to ground level, but not before snapping a few more shots. Of particular note are the posters and billboards adorning the buildings on both sides of the street, many of them shouting out not just characters on the roster, but other properties as well. 
There's a billboard of Morrigan labeling her a temptress of the night. Directly across the street, you have an Iron Man billboard, as well as one for Oscorp, the company owned by Norman Osborn, aka the Green Goblin. The Iron Man billboard has some text on it that says, don't think this armor can be destroyed so easily. Big words coming from a guy known for making armor specifically meant to beat specific people, and ends up usually getting his shit pushed in by said people regardless. Above the Oscorp billboard is a sign for pizza on 44th Avenue. Now, as a lifelong New Yorker, I can tell you, there's no pizza shop on 44th Avenue, and that's because there's no 44th Avenue in Manhattan. I'm going to assume they might have meant to put 44th Street, which is in Midtown and does in fact have more than one pizza shop along its length. Above that is a Heroes for Hire poster. Heroes for Hire is a private investigation agency started by Iron Fist and Luke Cage, but over the years would see a revolving door of street level heroes join up, like Misty Knight, Colleen Wing, and even Black Cat. Next up is a billboard for Internet Bubble, which apparently seems to be a cross between an internet cafe and a laundromat. Internet Bubble itself is a play on words based on an actual term. The term was coined in the 1990s during the rise of the internet and generally centered around the potential market value of businesses started up via the internet. Across the way is a billboard for a pest control company, as well as a Chun-Li poster saying crushing kicks go home before you get hurt. That sounds pretty painful to me, but there is probably some people out there that see that as being threatened with a good time. We've got a Nelson and Murdoch billboard over here, which is of course the law firm that Matt Murdoch, aka Daredevil, is a part of. As well as an ad for the Kerry Castle, which I'm assuming is a bar. Look a bit further down the street and you'll glimpse a poster of Damage Control, the agency that cleans up after the messes that occur in New York City when battles between Marvel heroes and villains happen. Above it is a poster for the Coffee Bean a coffee shop that's been featured as a backdrop in past Spider-Man stories. Look further down the street and there's a billboard for a something called The Hole. <laughs> no comment. If you look down at street level, you can spot a beautiful Joe float. Over to the left are more character billboards, one for Spider-Man by the Daily Bugle, which is on brand, and one for Ryu. You know, the Marvel characters I get. But how did they get these photos for the Capcom characters? Did they do a photo shoot? Ryu seems like the kind of character it'd be hard to pin down for that kind of thing. There's some generic posters down the block for a gym, transportation services, and a music store. But tucked behind the buildings on the right are two more character posters for Hulk and Captain America. Like the Spider-Man posters, the accompanying text is pretty on brand. The scaffolding eventually reaches its peak and stops, giving you a pretty great view of Manhattan, south of Midtown. You've got the Daily Bugle to the left here looking a bit more similar to the version in Marvel Super Heroes, though it's again in a different place. You can see the Empire State Building in the distance and further out the Statue of Liberty. If you look in the center of the city, you can also spot the Baxter Building again, looking pretty similar to how it did in Marvel 1. It's neat how this stage combines elements of every prior Daily Bugle stage in the series. Speaking of prior stages, like the Daily Bugle stage, there's a helicopter flying around that becomes more prominent once you reach the top. On the helicopter is J. Jonah Jameson and what looks like a Daily Bugle photographer. Said photographer is pretty clearly being hounded by Jonah here. Poor guy. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3 adds a new variant of the stage, the city that never sleeps. The name is taken from one of the nicknames of New York City itself and fittingly takes place at night. The scaffolding is entirely stationary this time around, so we're at street level for the whole match. You can see a bunch of traffic in the background, which, yeah, that's rush hour in this city for you. There's a few new signs and billboards that weren't here in the original version of the stage. There's a Stark Industry sign down the street. Closer to the foreground, there's a poster for Feast, the Food, Emergency, Aid, Shelter, and Training Project. This was a charity founded by Martin Lee, also known as the Negative Man. It's been in the comics for about as long as Negative Man has, 
Though it gained further prominence in the last few years as a part of Insomniac's PS4 Spider-Man game. Down the street is a theater with an electronic banner that advertises a show at the MVC Music Hall, which I'm sure is meant to be a shout out to Radio City Music Hall at Rockefeller Center. It goes on to advertise a performance featuring Felicia and Dazzler. This is more than likely the concert that's depicted in Felicia's arcade mode ending. It also mentions a performance by Hypno Hustler, another Marvel character. Marvel vs. Capcom 3 also has stage themes in addition to character themes, which can be used if you change the music settings in the options menu from classic to dynamic. The Daily Bugle theme is a neat orchestrated piece with a brass lead that ramps up in intensity as each character on the team is knocked out. I have a lot of nostalgia for this theme, as the very first gameplay video ever released for Marvel 3 uses this stage and music, and I must have watched that trailer at least a thousand times. Spidey's final appearance in the series is in Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. His voice actor in Marvel Infinite is Robbie Damon. This isn't his first rodeo with Spidey. He's voiced him in many things over the last decade or so, from the Avengers Assemble cartoon to the 2017 Spider-Man show. He also does a ton of anime and game voice work, having voiced Prompto in Final Fantasy XV, Sori in Tales of Zeteria, Happy Chaos in Guilty Gear Strive, and most recently, Chai in Hi-Fi Rush. Play Hi-Fi Rush! His theme in this game, like every other Marvel character, is an original piece made for this game, and honestly, it's one of the better ones in the game. It seems to intentionally invoke the musical stylings of the Sam Raimi movie trilogy, and while it's not as good as his previous games, it works pretty well for what it is. It's also one of the few tracks from this game I can listen to outside of the context of the game itself. He gets some new stuff this time around, but some of his commands have been shuffled around a bit input-wise. Notably, two of his medium normals in past games have been made command normals. First is Flying Roundhouse, done with forward and heavy kick in the air. This used to be his jumping medium kick in past games. He has a brand new command normal as well, Straight Arrow, done with forward and heavy punch. His second returning medium normal is Hidden Kick, done with down forward and light kick. This used to be his crouching medium kick, and like in past games, comboing this into heavy kick serves as an alternate launcher. Web Ball is largely the same as in previous games. Web Ball! Spider Sting has had its Dragon Punch motion changed to a down down input instead. Come on! Man. Web Swing's been reverted back to its Marvel vs. Capcom 2 input, being a quarter circle back and kick. He retains Web Glide from Marvel 3, now initiated by pressing both kick buttons in a direction. Zip. Zip. Spidey also gets a new move altogether, Spider Cannon, done with a quarter circle forward and kick. He springs back a bit before slingshotting himself at the opponent feet first. The heavy variation of this also wall bounces. Web Throw is back as well, though how you do the other variants has been changed. Tapping Heavy Punch does the diagonal variant, while holding it does the version that goes straight upwards. Web throw. Gotcha. Gotcha. Web throw. Crawler Assault is mostly like its Marvel 3 incarnation, though it's now done with a quarter circle forward in two punches. Assault. Ultimate Web Throw reverts back to its Marvel vs. Capcom 1 and 2 input, but still retains its function as a strictly anti-air super for Marvel 3. Blast, courtesy of your friendly neighborhood wall crawler. Maximum. Maximum Spider functions the same as in Marvel 3, though it's now done with a quarter circle back and two kicks. Beat down. How's that for a web swing and smackdown? Get ready. 
Secure! With great power! Come some great! Beat down! How's that for a web sling and smackdown? Characters are generally a lot more talkative in this game than in past entries, but Spider-Man takes that to the next level. That said, that's actually pretty fitting for him, so I don't mind it here. Spidey also gets a level 3 for the first time. Watch out, Spidey. Spidey style! Ah! My Spidey senses are on fire! The great goblin! No one to take that hit, Norman! And he's gone. Maximum! It starts with him about to pummel the opponent before his spider sense goes off and the Green Goblin launches some pumpkin bombs from off screen. Spidey webs them up and launches them at the opponent. Considering a lot of level 3s in the game are just a few strikes into a launcher into some kind of projectile, I appreciate that this one gets a little bit more creative. The maneuver he pulls off here is taken from this Green Goblin battle scene from the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Here are Spidey's colors. Color 2 is his Negative Zone suit. The Negative Zone is a hostile antimatter universe that some characters like Spidey and the Fantastic Four occasionally find themselves in. Color 3 is based off of his Heavy Kick color from Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Color 4 is based off of Spinneret, Mary Jane's spider outfit from Renew Your Vows, an alternate universe Spidey story where one more day never happened and Peter and MJ remained married and had a child. Spider-Man's alternate costume in this game is the Superior Spider-Man. Dying from years of battles against Spider-Man, Dr. Octopus pulls a last-minute trick on Spidey, stealing his body and leaving Peter to die in his old, decaying body. Octavius, having gotten a flood of Spidey's memories in the process, resolves to try and uphold Peter's legacy as Spider-Man, but on his terms, becoming a better, superior Spider-Man. Peter eventually gets his body back, but Otto learns a lot about great power and responsibility during his time as Spider-Man. He's also the Spider-Man that recruits Insomniac Spider-Man for the Spider-Geddon crossover, and if you know Insomniac Spidey's relationship with his own Octavius, you'd get why there's a lot to unpack there. Color 2 is based off of Spider-Gwen, who debuted for the Spider-Verse comic crossover and quickly became a fan favorite, no doubt due to that amazing costume. Color 3 is based off of Superior Venom. At one point Octavius, still in Peter's body, extracts the Venom symbiote off of Flash Thompson and acquires it for himself. It goes about as well as you'd expect. The final color is the comic version of the Iron Spider suit. This suit gave Peter mechanical appendages long before the Superior Spider-Man suit did, so it's neat to see that he finally gets them here, even if they're cosmetic. Here are all of Spidey's character interactions. Spider-Man! Great! It's my friendly neighborhood cameraman. Spider-Man! You don't like spiders? But we're so cuddly! Spider-Man! Try to keep your parasites to yourself, Eddie. If you're wearing armor, you must be expecting a butt whooping. If I were to go easy, I would be breaking my oath as a knight. Who will come out on top? Ready! Hey, hey! I take the pictures around here. Get back! You... Who will come out on top? Ready! Is that a cybernetic arm? Oh, man. I'll take on whoever wants some of this. Who will come out on top? Ready. Hey, kid face. You ready? Good. I'm ready. I hope. Gamora, listen to your father for once. Who will come out on top? Ready. I'm definitely going to need a lot of web fluid for this one. Why try to fight us? We who are God. Who will come out on top? Ready. Okay, Spidey. You're just fighting a battle that can control the universe. Do you think you can defeat us? Ready.
For as long as Spidey's been in the Versus series, it's amazing how consistent he's been both visually and mechanically. With the exception of Marvel 3, where he's a bit more technical and execution heavy, he's a really easy character for anyone to pick up. And considering he's Spider-Man, I imagine a lot of first time players of the series might gravitate to him just because, well, he's Spider-Man. It's been a pretty okay time to be a Spider-Man fan. The main Amazing Spider-Man book is, well, that's a thing that's still running I guess. Though Jonathan Hickman is helming a new take on the character in Ultimate Spider-Man. And the man behind this spectacular Spider-Man cartoon, Greg Wiseman, is going to be writing a Peter Parker and Miles Morales team-up book appropriately titled Spectacular Spider-Man in 2024. The Spider-Verse movies have been great, No Way Home was surprisingly fun, and there's of course been the amazing, pun intended, Insomniac Spider-Man games as well. That's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching, take care, and stay safe. I'll see you next video.